Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's subject presents 10 ways to grapple with doubts. You may have heard it said that it's better to doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs than to doubt your beliefs and believe your doubts. God certainly wants us to know for sure. The Bible calls it full assurance of understanding, full assurance of hope, and full assurance of faith. So what are some ways to practically regain the high ground of certainty? Let's take a look. Number one, understand the taste buds of the soul. Now what does that mean, the taste buds of the soul? Well, they say that simply with the four different kinds of taste, sweet and sour, salty and bitter, we can determine all sorts, a vast array of flavors. And in the same way as our taste buds sort of pile up on each other, so the emotions do. So seasickness, homesickness, lovesickness, all the same feeling in the pit of our stomach. And if we want to know whether we need to go home or get off the ship or get married, we need to look outside of ourselves. We can't tell just from the feeling. Well, the same is true of the impressions on the spirit. A person who is lost and the spirit of God is convicting them of their need of a savior has the same impression on their spirit of a person who is saved, but perhaps not walking with the Lord and having serious doubts, or a person who is a believer and is seeking to be obedient to the Lord and the devil is trying to dishearten them. So in order to understand what's the actual situation, they're going to have to look outside of themselves. They're going to have to look into the Word of God. Number two, notice the present tense of belief. All of the verses that talk about believing don't say he who once believed, but maybe he doesn't believe anymore. It's always in the present tense. He who believeth. The one who is now believing. So that's really a question a person needs to ask. If they're struggling with doubts, I'm not sure if I did it the right way when I was five years old at my mother's knee. Don't be too terribly concerned about that. At this moment, ask yourself the question, am I a sinner before God, a guilty, hell-deserving sinner? Did Christ die for sinners just like me? Do I want him to be my savior? Am I willing to trust him now? Well, if so, then I'm one of those people who now believe, he that believes. Do I now believe these things? If I do, then what the Bible says is true about me. And number three, see that the object of faith is a person. This is so helpful. There's so many people, I don't know if I said the right words, I don't know if I had enough faith, I don't know if I believed in the right way, not sure people talk about repenting and all these different words that are used for salvation, come, receive, trust, don't know if I did all those things the right way, and we make it so complicated. But Paul makes it clear when he writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed. So my faith is not in faith, it's not in how I believed. It's not on how I did anything. It's on what Christ did. When he said it's finished, it's finished. And my faith is in him. So it's simply transferring my trust to him. It's not the amount of faith. It can be like a mustard seed. So I can have a truckload of faith in a false religion. It doesn't do me a, an inch of good. But even a little faith placed in him, he secures my faith. And that's really key. He said to Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. People wonder like, well, what if I once believed and then I lost it because I don't believe anymore? No, says the Lord Jesus. Once you put your faith in me, I secure your faith. I feed your faith. I give you evidence to believe. I support you in your faith. So he takes on the responsibility of making sure we get home safely. And number four, recognize that we cannot assure ourselves. 
I like the words of 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, where he says, We shall assure our hearts before him. Just as we can't save ourselves, we can't assure ourselves. The Lord has to do that in our hearts. And he goes on to say, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. So you have the seal of God, like a foundation stone. There's a seal on the side that everyone else can see, and there's a seal on the top that God can see. The seal on the top says, the Lord knows those that are his. And the seal on the side says, and let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the Lord knows, the Christian shows. If I'm not showing, the Lord still knows. That's the point of this verse. When I tremble, the rock doesn't tremble under me. And so my security is not based on my knowledge, on the amount of faith, but in the person I'm trusting. And salvation is simply taking your trust from your own good works, your own religion, your own belief system, philosophy, and you're transferring it to him. Once that happens, the deal is done, and he takes on the charge of getting us all the way safely home. Number five, realize the devil uses doubt to neutralize our effectiveness. Yes, if the devil can't rob you of your spiritual life, and he can't, he'll rob you of the power of the influence of that life by making you miserable. He'll steal away your joy. This is what David prayed, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. It wasn't the salvation that needed to be restored, it was the joy. And he had lost the joy because he lost the assurance. I think of a man an elderly gentleman that I met in Alberta many years ago and he came to me and he said you know I've been saved for many years but every time I get into bed at night I start thinking about all my sin and I can't sleep and I'm just exhausted and I said well now are these sins confessed to the Lord yes well then it's not the Lord reminding you because he doesn't remember them himself. He's put them into the sea of his forgetfulness. It's that old devil, the accuser of the brethren, who's doing it. And why is he doing it? Why does he keep doing it every night? Well, because it works. <laughs> He's making you miserable. And if you're miserable, you're not showing the joy of the Lord to others. So, the joy of the Lord is your strength, says Nehemiah. And if we lose our joy, we become like the 98-pound weakling kicked around by the devil. We need to see our joy restored by having our assurance restored. So I said to him, um, you know why he's doing this? He's not after you. He's after God. When he went after Job, he wasn't after Job. He said, if you do this to Job, he'll curse you to the face. Instead, Job bowed down and worshiped. My dad used to say, three cheers for Job. In the midst of that all, he never lost his confidence in God. So I said to this man, what you need to do is turn this to the glory of God. And if you do, the devil will stop doing it because it's counterproductive. So you get down the moment you're aware of this and you lay it on the Lord and you tell him how wonderful he is and how amazing it is that he saved you from all his sins. Don't give the devil any credit, but just say, I've been reminded what a wicked sinner I've been and how wonderful your grace is and how cleansing your blood, and how full your forgiveness. And I'm just so happy that you don't remember any of these things. They're all gone, and they're all forgiven. And then climb back into bed and see how it works. I saw him three or four days later. He came over and gave me a big hug. He said, I'm sleeping like a baby. He didn't mean he was waking up every four hours. He meant that he had a heart, a conscience free, and he was able just to sleep in peace. The Lord gives his beloved sleep. So when the enemy does this, he wants to trip us up and get our eyes off Christ and on ourselves. And when we're looking at ourselves, it's downhill all the way. Peter found that out. We got to get our eyes back on the Lord and say, it's not the measure of my faith, it's his faithfulness that's going to get me through. Number six, we have memorized five key verses like John 5, 24 or John 10, 27 through 30. These verses that will 
help us in those times. Yes, if you're haunted by this, and there are certain people who tend to be very honest and introspective, and that's a deadly combo. Because Paul says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So there's no use looking inside to find something encouraging. David, who was introspective, artistic, and could be sometimes very pensive, he said, Lord, you look inside and you see if there's any wicked way in me and you lead me in the way everlasting. I'm not going to look in there. If my heart is desperately wicked, who can know it means who can get to the bottom of it? I'm going to dig through the filth and get to the slop and dig through the slop and get to the garbage. I'm going to give up on that project. The way I'm changed is not by looking inside, but beholding as in a mirror the Lord's glory, looking into his word and looking for Christ, not looking for myself. But like Moses, I'll come down the mountain with my face glowing. I won't even know the change has occurred, but it will have occurred because I'm looking at Christ and not at myself. So, Write these verses, maybe in the, in the back of your Bible, a place you can find them easily and regularly. Read them over, meditate on them, and ask how much faith is needed to believe in God. So we can use the shield of faith. In other words, I take God seriously. I take what he said seriously. We can use the helmet of salvation to protect our thoughts, our minds. When we feel attacks coming to the mind, Look and see what God's salvation is and what it does for us. And then we can use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to maintain our confidence in God by reading these verses, memorizing them, meditating on them, and saying, I believe every word that God says. And number seven, where is the object of my faith? What Christ did on the cross makes us safe. What God says in his word makes us sure. If we keep that in mind, what Christ did on the cross makes us safe. What God says in his word makes us sure. Remember the verse we began with, we shall assure our hearts before him. It's in the word of God and his promises that we'll find the answer. So, obviously, if the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, and I say, well, I, I do believe I'm a sinner. I do believe Christ died for sinners. I do believe Christ died for me. I do believe that if I accept him as my Savior, I'll be saved. Well, then what does God say? He doesn't say if you feel saved, you're saved. He doesn't say if you saw me come in, if you felt me come in, if you're having a supernatural spiritual experience every day if you're tiptoeing on the mountaintops. He doesn't say any of that. The Lord said, if you open the door, I will come in. He keeps his promise. So that's the question. If I say I believe, and yet I'm not sure that I'm saved, who's making the mistake? Either God has failed to keep his promise, or you have failed to believe what God has promised. Well, obviously, it's not, it's not God. And so we just have to get back to say, wait a minute, the plain promise of God is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. I have believed, I take God at his word, and that's a key. Number eight, many look to Christ to save them, and then to themselves for assurance. Listen, let me tell you a little story. A man who's an evangelist in Scotland, back in the old days before they had asphalt roads, they used to have stone breakers that would break up the stones into gravel and fill the potholes. The old man's working in the sun, and along comes the preacher and says, I'd like you to come to the gospel meeting. He said to him, if you break stones for me for two hours, I'll come to your meeting. So the young fellow threw off his jacket, worked for two hours, filled in the potholes. The man says, there's no sense me coming to your gospel meeting. You preachers always we just got one string on your harp, always talking about believing, but you never tell us what it means. Unless you can tell me what it means, how's that going to help? And the young man said, I'll tell you what it means to believe. It means to take the word of an old stonebreaker who said that if I'd work for him for two hours, he'd come to my meeting. And if you're a man of your word, you'll be there. And the old fellow said, do you mean to tell me that's what it means to believe the Bible, to believe Christ, just to take him at his word? The young man said, I know of no other kind of belief than just take God at his word. Faith 
comes by hearing the word of God. Is that what God says? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Do you believe what God says about you and about Christ and about the way of salvation? And how can you disagree with God? Because he says you shall be saved. So number nine asks, what is God's promise to me if I believe what he says? Well, he keeps telling us this. John 3.16 is a famous verse. I believe the most famous verse that's ever been quoted. And we all know what it says. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's his promise. The verse that God used in my life was John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's it. Those are the essential elements. God's Son, my sin, I agree with God about both. My sin's the problem, His Son's the answer. And the moment I believe that, there's nothing about praying a prayer, walking forward, putting up your hand, feeling a certain way, nothing about that. Just accepting God's terms. I'm the sinner Jesus died to save. He died for me. If I believe, if I put my trust in his finished work, God says I'm saved. And that's all I've got. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And then finally, number 10. After all this, what if I don't feel saved? So we've been given nine things I've gone through this list. After all this, what if I don't feel saved? You know, one of my favorite passages in the Word of God is found in the last half of Hebrews chapter 6. And in Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible tells us that God wants us to have full assurance. That was one of the verses we began with. And he tells us that God wants us to be sure. And so God made a promise. That should have been enough. But God wanted to make it absolutely sure, and so he not only made a promise, he sealed it with an oath. Now the problem was that we always swear by something greater. That's why people put their hand on the Bible in a law court. But there's nothing greater than God. So what God did was he swore by himself. In other words, he put his own character down as collateral to guarantee that anyone who believes on his son will be eternally secure. So if you don't make it to heaven after you believed on the Lord Jesus, God will cease to be God. (laughs) that's, That's how sure he wants you to be. But he didn't just make a promise and seal it with an oath and guarantee the collateral with his own character. But then we read, he gave us an anchor of the soul sure and steadfast inside the veil. So the idea here is this, that Christ, who is our life, has already entered into heaven. I'm as sure of being in heaven as if I were already there, because Christ is my life, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. So my life is already secure in heaven. Now, over in that part of the world, they're very shallow harbors, and the sailing ships couldn't get into the harbor in times of storm. So they put the anchor into a little rowboat, they'd row the anchor in, they'd secure it in the harbor. The ship was still out in the storm, tossed around in the storm, but the anchor was safe and secure. And so we're out in the storms of life and sometimes we get a little seasick, we feel a little upset, we're not sure where we stand. We'd like to get on solid ground and we feel very topsy-turvy. But we know our anchor, our life, is already secured inside the veil. And we feel him reeling us in. Little by little, we recognize, he says, I give to my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. So my security is based on his faithfulness, not on my faith. The least amount of faith placed in Christ, if I just believe what he says, God says, I can be absolutely sure. Feelings come and go, but God's word remains secure. And that's why we base our assurance not on how we feel on any particular day, but on what God says in his word. And we rest on that. We assure our hearts before him in his word.